Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome back to our look at the anti-vax movement. You know, many of us have seen anti-vax videos on YouTube and one of the things that they really like to talk about is something called the Vaccine Injury Court. Now that's something that we have here in the United States. It was established as kind of a no-fault insurance for the vaccine producers back in 1988. And since that time, it has compensated people that had vaccine injuries to the tune of $4.2 billion. So, rather than speculate what this is about, I went ahead and talked to one of the leading vaccine injury attorneys in the United States, and I also reviewed all the documentation from the vaccine injury court that I could find online. So let's have a look and see exactly how much of a problem vaccine injury truly is. Roll the music. Welcome back. Now, I think the way we need to start this is to have a look at the law itself. Uh, the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986 went into effect in 1988. But the important thing to remember and to keep in mind is that the vaccine injury court was set up as a no fault to ensure the future supply of vaccines because pharmaceutical companies are not going to produce vaccines if the liability costs are so great that they just can't financially do it. Now, two things that are very interesting about the vaccine injury court. Lawyers that represent vaccine injury cases are paid whether they win or lose. They are paid by the court. They are not paid by the patient. And that includes the lawyer that you hire to take your case to the vaccine court. The court pays them, you don't. They're not allowed to work on contingencies. They don't get a portion of the award. They're paid a set fee and the court awards that to them. So everything that you are awarded goes directly to you. That's kind of a cool way of doing it. As the title of the law states, it was designed specifically to encourage children to have vaccines. And this was done by preventing excessive liability on the part of vaccine manufacturers, keeping the cost of the vaccines down, and to provide a swift and equitable court for adjudication of claims of vaccine injury. Now, I think it's a very important point to note, not all vaccinations are covered by this Vaccine Injury Compensation Act. Only vaccinations that are recommended for children are covered. So certain types of pneumonia vaccines that are recommended for adults and the shingles vaccine are not covered. Vaccines that you get as part of the military are not covered. Now, for example, here is a website for an attorney that does vaccine injury cases, and he's got a list of the vaccinations on his websites. And again, additional ones may be added in the future. Now, looking at the number of vaccine injury cases that have been taken to this vaccine court, you see that there are about one in a million doses of vaccinations that receive any sort of compensation. Now, in order to go to the vaccine injury court, you need to meet certain criteria. In general, there is a table that lists the known injuries associated with each vaccination. And here's an example of that table right here. 12 pages to this table, a link will be provided if you'd like to review it. Tetanus shots, which is the first one up here. Anaphylaxis, which is an allergic reaction, has to occur within four hours of the injection of the vaccine. Now the next thing you see under the tetanus shot is brachial neuritis. This is a mechanical injury to the nerves in the upper arm. And it needs to be reported not less than two days after the shot, so it's not just a sore arm, and nor any more than 28 days after the shot. Now the next vaccine listed is a particular formulation of a pertussis vaccination. A whole cell preparation is what they call it. Now the two things that you can be compensated for if you get such a vaccination would be anaphylaxis, which is the allergic reaction, and encephalitis, which is an inflammation or a dysfunction of the brain. As you notice, you have to report these symptoms within a certain period of time. The anaphylaxis has to occur within four hours of the shot, and the encephalitis has to occur within 72 hours. 
Now, two other injuries that would be covered under this particular vaccination would be, again, a shoulder injury from the physical act of putting a needle into somebody's arm. And the other one is passing out from the shot. Now, I spoke with an attorney today that has a national vaccine injury practice. They basically filled me in on a couple of criteria that the court look at. Number one, the vaccination that you are complaining of, is it a covered vaccination? So for example, if I got a yellow fever vaccine in the military, that wouldn't be covered under this. A, I received it as an adult, and B, it's not a routine recommended vaccination. Travel vaccinations are not covered for the most part. Now two, you need to have an injury that is on this table that is in the time frame listed on the table. So for example, if you developed encephalitis, did it occur within 72 hours of the vaccination? Now that doesn't mean that you have to be diagnosed within 72 hours. It means that you have to report the symptoms within 72 hours. It may take a little longer to diagnose you but you just have to say that something's wrong. The other thing you wanna look at for something like a shoulder injury, for example, uh, did it persist for a period of time? And what this attorney told me was six months is the usual time frame that they're looking at. Or did you require surgery or additional medical care for that injury? That means that if you have these criteria, the vaccine is considered the guilty culprit. That's the important thing. The burden of proof is on the vaccine to prove its innocence if you meet these criteria. That's different than a normal court of law where you have to prove that something caused an injury. In the vaccine injury court, the vaccine has to prove that it's innocent. That's kind of a little twist. It's a very low burden of proof. Now, consequently, if you lose in the vaccine court with its very low burden of proof, your chances of prevailing in civil court are very low. When would you go to civil court on a vaccine injury? You go to civil court after you lose in the vaccine court, or if the vaccine is not a covered vaccination. So for example, if I have an adverse reaction to a vaccination against dengue fever, I could take that to civil court, but I couldn't take an adverse reaction I had to a flu shot to civil court without going to the vaccine court first. Okay, how much compensation actually occurs due to vaccine injuries in the United States? Well, let's have a look and see what the statistics say. Now, these statistics cover approximately 2006 to 2017. 3.14 billion doses of vaccines were administered. So let's go over this document a little bit. This is from the Health Resource and Service Administration, basically the National Public Health Service here in the United States that is part of the administration of this court. They put out statistics on what goes on in the court on a monthly basis. I will be linking all of this information in the description of this video, but we'll go over this one in particular. Now this is kind of interesting right here. 70% of all compensation is a result of a negotiated settlement. What does that mean? Well, according to the attorney that I spoke with today, the burden of proof is pretty standard. If you meet the criteria, there's really not that much of a point in fighting it out in court. The vaccine's considered guilty, you get compensated. Now down here, you'll notice that between 2006 and 2017, there were 3.4 billion doses of covered vaccines. There were 4,525 cases of compensated vaccine injury. That means that approximately one out of a million doses of vaccines resulted in a compensated injury. Now here's another interesting statistic. Since 1988, there have been 18,473 petitions adjudicated by the vaccine court. Just over 7,000 of them were compensated and the rest were dismissed. Now of those 7,044 patients, a total payout, including attorney's fees, has been some $4.2 billion. And you're more than welcome, there's the website right there, to go have a look at these reports individually. And of course, there'll be a link to this in the description as well. Now you would think that when you were compensated for a vaccine injury, the injury was due to something in the vaccination. Let's go ahead and have a look at a vaccine injury case file from one nationally recognized attorney. 
Of these, we have 139 cases listed on this attorney's website. Of those 139 cases, we had one case of Bell's palsy. We had 23 cases of Guillain-Barre, and we had 115 cases of injury to the arm related not to the vaccine, and the attorney makes that clear. It's not related to the vaccine. It's related to putting a needle in somebody's skin. Now again, of the millions of doses of vaccinations that are given every year, you are going to have medical errors where you have a, uh, an injury due to an injection. You're gonna have an allergic reaction. Of those 139 cases, only 24 had anything whatsoever to do with the vaccine itself. The rest were just injuries from an injection, and that injection could have been for anything. Now, all but 17 and a quarter percent of this attorney's clients were injured due to the mechanical nature of a shot and had had nothing at all to do with a vaccine. The fact that they were giving an injection of vaccine qualified them to seek compensation through the vaccine injury fund. But the injury they received had no bearing whatsoever on the vaccine. It could have been sterile water. I find that fascinating, don't you? So when you hear people claim that $4.2 billion has been paid out by the Vaccine Injury Fund, number one, the vast majority of the injuries are simply arm injuries due to the shot that have nothing to do with the vaccine. Second of all, the injuries tend to be rather well compensated. And third of all, there's a very limited number of people compensated. I mean, since the inception of the program, there's only been 18,000 some odd people that even made it to court, and the majority of those were dismissed. Now what's more, in addition to the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, this is updated periodically. Here's one from 2016 where they added some additional conditions. So they keep an eye on this and update it to try and get compensation available for true vaccine injuries. The bottom line is, even though they're expanding the program, and even though the burden of proof is very low compared to a civil trial, the vaccine is essentially considered guilty if you meet the criteria of the table. Even though all of that is there, very few people are actually being compensated for vaccine injuries because they are that rare, on the order of one in a million doses of vaccines. Now, another important thing to remember is the number of illnesses, morbidity, and mortality that was prevented by these vaccinations far outweigh the number of cases of compensation through the Vaccine Injury Fund. Now, to give you an example of how bad this can get, in Samoa this year, we had an epidemic of measles due to very low vaccination rates, down from over 90% down to approximately 35%. More than 100 people died, half of which were children under the age of five. What was the cause of that? It was a vaccine scare because two infants died in Samoa as a result of getting a measles vaccination. Now, did they die of the measles vaccination or a complication of the measles vaccination that is directly related to the vaccine? Absolutely not. They died because of a medical error where they mixed an expired muscle relaxant instead of sterile water with a powdered vaccine. It was a medical error. It was a nursing error. But it didn't have anything at all to do with the vaccine. However, the scare that it put into the population of Samoa resulted not only in all these deaths, but resulted in mandatory vaccination. And in one case that I'm aware of, somebody that was an anti-vaccine advocate that recommended giving vitamins and other quackery was actually arrested by the government for endangering public health. Now that was in Samoa, it wasn't in the United States. Well, let's return to the United States. This is an article from the Journal of Infectious Diseases concerning measles incidence rates in the United States prior to and after the introduction of the measles vaccination in 1963. Now, as you can see from 1956 until 1960, approximately one in 100 people got measles in the United States. This resulted in 48,000 hospitalizations and over 400 deaths. 
When the measles vaccination was licensed in 1963 and an eradication program to get everybody immunized was set up, there were actually three of them, the incidents went from one in a hundred to one in a thousand within just a couple of years, and now it currently sits at about one in a million. And looking at the news, that seems to be about right. Because of vaccine hesitancy, we're getting these pockets of measles throughout the country. And about 350 people a year are affected. That's roughly one in a million for our population. Now let's look at this in, in the context of the vaccine injury court. Now the vaccine injury court in an 11 year period covered 3.4 billion vaccinations and approximately 780 people were compensated because they were injured by the vaccine. Now, more than 80% of those injuries were simply due to the mechanical trauma of having a needle put in your arm or a medical error. It had absolutely nothing to do with the vaccination, nothing whatsoever. So 780 people were injured by a vaccination and compensated. Now, during that same 11 year period, based on the earlier incidence rate, we would have had 500,000 hospitalizations and 4,000 deaths from measles alone. That doesn't include the other vaccinations that are covered under the vaccine court and were included in the 780 cases that were compensated for vaccine injury. I think that pretty much gives you a risk to benefit ratio and resolves this issue uh, with the fear of the vaccine court and the $4.2 billion that were paid for vaccine injuries. So in future episodes, we're gonna talk about the measles epidemic in Samoa and the impact that anti-vaxxers had on it. We're going to look into people that uh, started the anti-vax movement, such as Dr. Andrew Wakefield and Dr. Suzanne Humphreys. And then we're gonna actually have a look at some of the individual diseases such as measles and see the data from the vaccine injury cases, what the compensation was for, and what the true risks are. We'll also have a look at the composition of the vaccinations individually to see whether they have mercury or other things that could cause side effects, for example, that are talked about in the anti-vax movement quite a bit. In the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Hey, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button down there. I think this is an important series, and if you want to share this around, please feel free. So we'll see you soon. Thanks for stopping by.